Hey guys, before we start the video, I just want to quickly shout out my Discord in the bio below where you can join and enter a raffle for a free coaching replay review session for any position in MMR. After the posting of this video, the winner will be chosen in two weeks and announced in my Discord. So, did you feel like you were a bit tense yesterday? Like, were you feel like you were nervous or anything like that? Or are you just trying to have fun? Uh, tense, yes. Uh, nervous initially. But the nerves melted away once I realized I could actually play the game. Yeah. Um, so the big thing is, is like, kind of like you, you, you can just because there's like higher ranks in the lobby doesn't mean you have to play any differently. Of course, you you can you know listen to what higher ranks tell you and then you modify how you play according to how you know what they tell you. But you should just play what's comfortable to you. Do what's comfortable to you. Usually, if you try and go outside your comfort zone, like. Just, uh, I'm trying to, there's like a phrase I'm trying to think of. You take it too fast. If you take it too fast, you're not really going to gain anything. You kind of have to work things very slow. Mm -hmm. So, let's look at this game. I like to spend a lot of time in the laning phase. It's pretty important. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm totally down for, uh, hyper-analyzing things. Um, but, like, uh, precursor of going into this... Uh, I, a lot of the times when I'm like trying to play Dota, I kind of don't know how I'm gonna, how well I'm gonna play until I start playing. And it became very apparent to me that I wasn't playing well this game. And my morale by the by the time mid game hit, my morale was shot. Like, is this was a very mentally, like just this game for me mentally was just really really bad. That's okay. So Dota is part, you know, mental. Mm -hmm. Isn't always about mechanics. You have to always be mentally stable. It's not even about like being toxic or anything. It's just wanting to play the game. <laughs> this is good. Right. So make sure when you queue, you can spread it out to these two as well. Okay. Because all you have to do is hit them once, and then they get the full duration. So. This guy's getting low, so try not hyper fixate on that. Make sure like all these guys get it if you think this guy isn't gonna die. Like of course if there's like somebody coming from behind, you think this guy's gonna die, then you know, you can keep hitting him, but you're just wasting time. It, right, about applying the applying the Arctic bird to all of them. Yeah. So probably the first thing I've noticed in this game is you should probably block this camp before the game starts. Before the game starts, okay. Because what happens is, uh, if you, let's say, let's see, let's put Fog on both. So they didn't place a ward, but typically, if it's like higher MMR or anything, or the support knows what he's doing, before the game starts, he'll like place a ward somewhere. Usually they don't place a ward in this lane, usually, because mm -hmm. there's no really good ward spots. But let's, let's say they do. Let's say they place a ward like right here. They'll be able... To see you when you walk up to place the sentry ward down, and they'll say, "Okay, you know he's placed a sentry there," and he'll instantly deward it. So it's not it's not too bad to always do it during the pregame. I know some people have different opinions on it, but it's very it's hard to contest it if you place it during the pregame. Another okay. thing is is if uh, once you get into the rank, you start noticing that your small camp is getting blocked. Does that ever happen in your rank? Yeah, 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 it's, uh, it's another thing I would actually like to talk about as well. Like, it's been happening much more, um, especially in recent games, and I've been having a hard time dealing with it uh, because of the matchups. Okay, so, can you see my cursor? Uh, no, I don't think I can. Okay, I'm just gonna have to change it to screen. Alright, so when you're placing a sentry, I'll give you kind of like the basic sentry spots. Um, for here, I'm going to put this, like, in super slow-mo so you can see the box. You see this box? Mm -hmm. You want to pl place it typically here or here. The only issue is you don't really want to place it here because if they're blocking the small camp, then they might see your sentry while also blocking the small camp. Uh, okay. Right. So if you're doing during the pregame, you want to place it here. But let's say you only have like one century and you're like, oh shit, my small camp's blocked and I still need to block this. You can place it here and then you're like, oh, maybe I'll get this too. 
Mm -hmm. And this also kind of covers this area for OBS, too. That's another thing. For placing OBS in lanes, let's say you're playing Radiant. You're on Radiant safe lane. We'll do sentries for this, too. Actually, let's, let's finish Dire. Okay. So sentries right here to block, right? Some people like to place it here or here, but why do you think it's best to place it here? Um... Well, like you mentioned earlier, so it doesn't get uh, caught by the uh, ward when they're trying to block your pool camp. And it's usually harder to try and um, get to that one, so to speak, I guess. I'm not too sure, yeah, honestly. Yeah, that's exactly right. You don't want to place it here because it's on their side. And if, let's say, you're like, oh shit, he has a sentry, he's about to deward... You have to come all the way over here to try and contest that. And this guy, you know, this Earthshaker might fissure you and kill you, whatever. Mm. But if you have it right here, then this guy has to come over here or have to find it. Right. So it's a lot easier for it to be on your side. And then another thing, so in order to contest this, something that support players will do is, you see this box? So, if you place a sentry right here, it's out of vision. Like, let's say you're like, okay, I'm so fucking tired of, you know, my small camp being blocked, and I know it's going to be really important to pull. Like, it's going to be a hard lane. So, look, you did that. That's good. But remember, just do it during the pregame. Um, if you place a sentry right here, it will cover the entire camp for the whole duration. And nine times out of ten... When they go to block this camp, let's say they place it like here, 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 wherever, okay. it they won't see this ward, and you'll just be able to see it and just pick it off. Every single time they go for it. Okay, actually, that's awesome. Holy crap, okay. So for the Definitely dire, so. let's go for the dire. So for the dire, this is a bit tricky. Um, There's a couple of things as a support you should probably know, some cool tips and tricks. Um, I wish I had all vision. Anyways, just a cool cool tip or trick. If it's daytime or nighttime, if you're on dire and you're playing as a support and you're wondering, hmm, do they have a ward here, right? And typically, you know, you have to waste a sentry up there and it doesn't cover as much as you want. It's just bad, right? And you don't get it. In order to understand, like, for sure, if you know there's an observer there, you have to be careful when you do this. As a support, you walk through here, and you walk right here really quick, right in tower range. If this tower hits you while you're in range, that means they have a ward. Oh, okay. Alright, let's continuing on um, block contesting as support. So, are you mainly hard support or soft support? Mainly hard support. Okay. So, let's see. Let's first go over... Let's go over potentially where Radiant or Dire can like block this camp. So you can't really do the same thing as you can on Dire's for Radiant. You can't just place a ward and then get the entire thing. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm not 100% sure. Kind of like... I can't do it. Um, but typically, if this camp is going to be blocked, it's gonna the sentry is going to be in here. Because it's really hard to find the sentry. Or like here or something. Yeah, it's going to be yes. in the crevices. Yeah, I've noticed that. So, just keep that in mind. If it's blocked, probably place a sentry here. It's going to be your best chance. Okay. I'm getting messaged by somebody that you can place a sentry. Okay, apparently you can place a sentry right outside the box anywhere. And it'll cover the entire box. So, okay. that's really nice. Because for this one, for example... You can't. You a hundred percent cannot place it outside the box. And this is where I'm going to get this uh, to the next part of contesting this block. Is that typically if you're dire, or if you're radiant, if you're radiant hard support, you want to block this, right? Right. Do you know where to block it typically? Um, I've used the like the top left side. Right in here. Yeah. All right. So that's perfect. Um, it makes it so that. 
let's say you have some sort of lane vision over here or something, and you're seeing that he's coming over to try and take away that ward. If you see that, you should immediately come over here. And if he places a ward down, let's say he places it, I don't know, inside the box, because he really wants to get this ward, and he'll just deny the ward after. Um, okay. Do you know about that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You 100% should come over here and make sure you're not, like, low health or anything. Like, if you're low health, then just give him it, because you're not going to be able to do it unless you're just really good at the game. Like, if you just know how to shim your way, like, you know, needle the thread. Mm -hmm. Thread the needle, whatever. But you should be able to kill this every time, because he's he doesn't know for sure where your sentry is. So he's going to be standing right here, place the sentry, and it's going to take him at least six seconds to come over here, attack twice, and kill it. You should be able to kill this sentry a million times before he can kill your sentry. Okay. And most of the lane, in terms of like winning the lane, can just be determined by two things. Trades, so like trading and pulling, or stack and pulling. And you know about like creep, creep equilibrium and all that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to get better at like identifying the equilibrium for pulls and knowing when to pull two or three creeps. So you know but, how to half pull? Yeah. That's perfect. That's perfect. Like half pulling is just as is almost just as good as stack and pulling. And if you're able to do that almost every time, you'll you'll make your carry very happy. Okay. All right. Um. So I guess my first question would be, uh, when, like, I've noticed recently in my games I've been having trouble like I like getting to that pull and just like knowing when I should pull ahead of time. Um, you got any rule of thumbs for, for that, by chance? So, typically, right here, what do you think is about to happen? Well, this tower's going to not kill those creeps, though. And they're going to pull the, our creeps towards them, causing the lane to shove towards them. Yep, so, it's you can't really do anything about it right now, because the you know it's about to double up. These creeps are about to come here and double up on a wave, and it's going to be pushing down here. So it's going to be a little rough for your carry in the beginning. So you have you have two options. You can either, at one minute, you can stack and then pull the next wave and then completely erase a wave, which is really nice because it eliminates experience from whoever you're going against in lane and it makes you stronger against them. Mm -hmm. But typically, that's not a great idea if your carry is really struggling and low in region because it takes a lot a long time to do that. Right. So, yeah. Let's see if you uh so what you're doing here is great. You're using you should always use this ability for the most part off cooldown just because of the amount of health burn it does. But you should know that. You play lots of Wyvern. Yeah, yeah. Um the main thing I have trouble doing that was is I guess positioning and not taking too much damage during the Arctic burn and also like getting stunned or uh like any kind of mini disable. Like, I can only get five right clicks off during the Arctic Burn. If I get stunned or anything in between, it's like one to three at best. So, and so. The, the good thing about Arctic Burn is you only need to hit them once. So, like, in order to get your entire duration of burn off, you have to hit them once. Okay. And you have a shit ton of range to do it. So your other right clicks after that first right click is just extra right click damage. Like, no matter what, if you hit them once, they're going to get burned for however so many seconds. Right, okay. So, you shouldn't worry too much, and that's why you shouldn't trade too much. Oh, uh, okay, okay, gotcha. So, like, that let's works. say if both of them are coming up, like, you're trying to queue, and you're like, oh, fuck, I need to keep queuing because I want them to get the full duration of this. That's not how that works. Right, right. So, you can just go away. So, I will say that... Your carry right here didn't do a, a super duper job of... Why am I two times? Might be. He didn't do a super duper job at creating a good creep with Garubium. So, like, you see what he did right here? Mm -hmm. So, this is kind of like a note. So, this is great. These two, these two melee creeps, if you want to fix creep equilibrium and make it go towards your tower, you pull the creeps... To the range creep, right? And then it kills this range creep, and then they go back to hit the melee creeps, and all of a sudden, they have a range creep, and you don't. That means it'll push into your tower. That's great. Look what the AM does. 
he pulls it away because he's afraid of this right click, which is not an issue. So once he pulls this away, he's just going to aggro right click the creeps down, and then all of a sudden, the creep equilibrium is even more fucked for this lane. <laughs> so there's not a lot of oh, things that you're doing wrong. It's just your creep, your carry right now is just kind of fucking the lane. So now what happens is they're going to have their creeps over here for the majority of the lane if they're good enough. So at this awkward. point, at this point, your carry is full region. I would just stack. I would okay. stack once, and then just hopefully your carry can pull it back, which he does. He pulls it back. And now the, the Wick of Raven is a little bit better, but... Oh, look, that's a great half pull. And that's actually perfect for right now, because he was able to fix the equilibrium somehow. That was a bit of an issue for the Radiant, but... It is what it is. So like I said, you kind of always want to use your stuff off cooldown. You can always take a peek at their items. Make sure like, oh, this you know, Hoodwink is running low in region. Right. So here, a good deterrence is you can W the Earthshaker and slow down the, uh, the Hoodwink. So that he doesn't get to right-click you as much and they don't have to hurt you as much. You can also Q and hit them both because, you know, it's off cooldown. And then you get to run away, you can go over here, since this Earthshaker can't oh, okay. catch yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to take as much right-click. That's something you really want to avoid in the lane. It's, you, you really want to... It's all about trading. Right now, they're taking away probably 400, 500 of your health, and you take away none of their health. Mm, okay. That makes sense, yeah. Alright, so I'll... I'll work on trying to position better so I can do that more effectively. Yeah, so this is a bit rough. He's going to get this sentry. It is what it is. You you can either... You can do a couple things here. You can either decide that ha letting them have this big camp is okay, and you just contest it. Do you know how to contest their pools? Like, how to take away the aggro? Um, to some degree, yeah. I have a hard time like doing it once it's, the creeps have met up. So with the camp. Yeah. So it's a bit. It's a bit strange in how it works. Um, it's like, let's see. So like, let's say this is the lane, right? Or let's do dire lane. Let's do a dire lane. This is the tower. This is that weird alley thing, and this is the hard camp, right? right? And there's the trees, trees, soft camp. And then we got some, you know, hard camp creeps. Um, If these creeps are coming into lane over here, and they pull like this, like you see it with their your ward, or you see it with your vision, you can sit here, press Q, and hit these creeps once, and those creeps will run towards this way. Okay, so like that. All right. That I know how to do. I just thought it was a way to do it like once. So you're actually you know. very good at disrupting creep, creep equilibrium or like just pulls just because I'm you can contest pulls, hard yeah. camp. Um, I noticed one? that it's easier to do it from here than it is on Radiant. Yeah, Radiant's a bit more difficult, which is why Radiant's... Um, like, this offlane is really nice for Dire. Because they can pull it into, like, the fog, and it's just really hard to see it. But for you, it's easy. You have this entire thing just to hit them from. As for right. when they're hitting the, let's say they actually get it off, and you're too late um, to, like, hit this, and you're coming over right here, and these creeps meet up, so they meet up, and they're hitting each other. Usually what happens is they're going to trade a couple blows, and then these creeps are going to de-aggro and run back to the camp, right? Right. So when that happens, you press Q, and you hit these creeps. Because then those creeps, these creeps will instantly lose aggro, and they'll follow you. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
that makes that the, the logic behind that makes a lot more sense because it it felt so inconsistent before, but now I understand it better. Thank you. So, but usually what will happen is like the heart, like the soft supports, either gonna he's gonna, he can either hit these creeps again and try and get the creeps to hit the hero because if it hits the hero, these creeps are gonna run back at the creeps. So it's a bit strange, but this this method right here is a lot more risky because it requires you to come over here, then take creep aggro. And you have a carry who's not so strong, so if the Earthshaker can just, you know, beat you up. Right. So you have to be very, like, you have to be, that's a very situational, something very situational to do. Typically, pulls like that aren't the worst. In lanes, like, if, let's say, the enemy gets a hard camp pull, sometimes it's not too bad. Because, let's say, they, they're just weaker heroes, like, uh, I don't know. Let me think. Let's say you have very two very strong heroes. Let's say you're like Wish Doctor Ursa, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like something weak into that. If they pull the hard camp, it's not the end of the world for you guys because they they can't contest these creeps, these hard camp creeps. Let's say you're going against the Underlord who's half HP. He can't walk up to hit that large camp creep, or else he'll die to Maledict and Ursa. So sometimes it's not always the end of the world. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because it gives you an opportunity to set something up. Yeah, and you also get the hard camp creeps, and those are extra XP and gold. Everything's like a balance between a lane. You two are fighting no. over a balance of gold and XP and region and everything. It's just like a scale, and whoever's more in favor is going to, you know, eventually beat the others in lane. Right, yeah. Um, uh, so, something I've always had in my mind is like if they get a pull off right and then the, like the creeps are all they all end up dying and then their camp is weak in a weakened state and like, like this most camp of the creeps are weakened. dead yeah. yeah couldn't you technically like I mean they would have to stack the camp but couldn't you technically leave that creep weak because yeah. if they try to pull again it'll actually cause the wave to stack and then so, have a double. Yeah, yeah, you can always do that. Um and the issue is though, is that they can pull and stack at the same time. Oh right, yeah. This is one of those yeah, it does. But do for that, here so. it's a little different. They can't this camp for the, I th I'm pretty sure, let's see, like thirty. They can probably pull and stack. I think both camps can pull and stack from a pretty safe, like they can definitely pull and stack, but it's a matter of it being safe for the enemy to do it. Mm, okay. Another thing I want to see is, like, it's a way to think about using your mana in the lane. So, you see how their mana is low, right? Mm -hmm. And look yeah. at your guys' HP. It's low as well. The way a lane works is you're trading mana for HP, basically. Well, look at bottom. It's it's not these. I mean, this lane is very sustainable. I mean, he's an ogre, axe, specter, nix. These are very, very sustainable uh, laners. Right. But the fact that, like, just looking at this guy having full mana is kind of ridiculous. You should never have full mana on a hero in a lane unless you're like. Unless you need Spectral Dagger to live, which is not the case. You should be using mana to trade with the opponent in the lane, forcing them to use regen, and then eventually putting them in a state where they can't lane anymore. It's a little hard to do that with Animage because he's not the greatest laner for now. You can maybe like start to mana up level 3, level 4 when he gets mm -hmm. higher levels yeah. and mana break. But you should I you should use at least use your Arctic Burn off cooldown. Because yeah. this is such a great value spell that burns a lot of their health for low cost. You can just hit these guys once and they run at you, you just run away. And they lose however so percent of their health. Alright, let's continue. So you lost the hard camp. So, what do you think is wrong with placing that sentry there? It immediately got deworded. 
Yeah, she but was already in position for her. Let's say you deward this, and he doesn't deward that. Then what's wrong? Um. Uh, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> it's well, like, what? Do you, what is this? The purpose of that ward? What is this ward? Why did he place this ward down? To deward my sentry from blocking the camp. And does this sentry block the camp? No. It doesn't. So, like, you're trying to counter his sentry so you can block the camp, right? Ideally, yeah. So, by you placing it right here, you know, it's great if you get the sentry, but then you're just doing nothing, right? Oh, I see, I see. You yeah. don't get to block the camp after all. Okay. Let's make, I'm just trying to confirm before... Let's see. Uh, five. Okay, yeah, so they do go two in win, uh, Winter Blast. Typically, you don't want to use your W until you get level three. Unless it's, like, defensively. Because the amount of mana it takes for the damage it does isn't really too great. Right, yeah, that I'm painfully aware of. <laughs> <laughs> so, until you hit level three, try and not use it as much as possible. Because you want to keep your mana as high as possible. And only using it on Arctic Burn. So you can trade in the lane effectively when you hit level three. That's kind of like your power spike as a hero, three and five. Right. Yeah. Um, those I've annotated down just from, from practicing. I will say that recently, though, I've been trying to try out like different ability builds because I would used to go heal level two uh, for the defensive aspect of it, but it just hasn't been working very well lately. So I've been trying to to, to change things up. So I think it. it can work in some lanes, but not in this current meta. So that was a good pool. But you see what he, see what he did there? He right-clicked the yeah. creeps and brought him back in. So getting a pool on Dire as a hard support on the hard, or hard camp is almost impossible. And then if you're a Radiant or hard support, it's extremely impossible. The camp would have to be back here. Like, their creeps, if you're a Radiant Heart support, has to be, like, back here in order for you to get a pull off here. Because you'd have to take them all the way down here and Dyer's all this vision of it. So, yeah, it's a good attempt to do it. It's also, like, a good attempt to, like, let's say this uh, Hoodwink is 100 HP, 200 HP or something. You could pull this... But your goal might not be just to even get the pull off. Your goal could just be killing the hoodwink. It's a win-win. Does that make sense? Because if the hoodwink comes yeah. up, he dies. So okay. It's all about just being aware. Player. Okay, that makes sense. So typically, clarities aren't the greatest to use unless you're like doing a pull like this. That's a good half pull. Well, kind of half pull. Yeah, slightly off on the timing. So, what you're, what you're kind of doing wrong here is typically you want to stay with the hard camp so you can get the gold and XP from these guys. And another thing what you want to do is, I, I meant to say this earlier, is that after typically after one half pull, you want to stack it and then do a full pull because I'm pretty sure if you... Uh, it may be different with certain creeps. But after a half pull, you maybe lose, like, some of the camp, and then after that, you know, if you have pool again, it's not going to be as effective. Right. So yeah, you should probably, you. like, after you have pool, the next minute should be used to stack it. Okay. That makes sense. Gotcha, gotcha. There we go. So it's all about using Arctic Burn off cooldown. So, one of the things that is really good as, as a ranged hero is, this is also something that's just kind of like mechanical skill, something you develop the more you play Dota, is, should you ever be that close to an Earthshaker? No. Yeah, so make sure you're keeping your range. And as a ranged hero, you should also be harassing the, the melee offlaner. From, like, a range from a distance, right? Right. And do you understand how creep aggro works in lane? Like, on creeps? Oh, um, yeah, creep aggro. Like, I understand how it works. I'm just... 
not good at doing it because I don't have a lot of opportunity to do it. So are you aware of like the whole like circle, like yeah, imaginary the circle? Enemy, yeah, the um, making sure when you do it, you have to be in a certain range of the enemy's creeps. Yeah, there's also a cool trick that you can do is that it's it's you can manipulate you can actually abuse that circle a bit so what i mean by that is let me just make a new thing um same thing let's say you're here creeps 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 creeps, creeps. and this is your imaginary circle right mm -hmm. and then there's the earth shaker contesting those creeps um in order for you, let's say you're walking up, walking up, walking up, and this Earthshaker's backing up, and then you right-click him right here, well, the Earthshaker's right here, you aggro the creeps, typically, right? Right. A way you can fix this is um, the Earthshaker's right here, you right-click once, so, okay, so the way the aggro works is when you right-click, that's when the imaginary circle takes place. So, if, let's say, like, if you right-click the enemy hero, and you're right here, and you let Dota do its thing, you walk up all the way, you could be standing right next to the creep, and there should be right here. You won't aggro the creeps. It's really hard oh, that, to... Yeah, that part I know. Uh, I'm trying to get better at doing that with harassing, but at that part so, I understand. Usually, typically, like, what really good, like, supports are very good at is playing that just game over and over again. Like, they'll be sitting right here, like, barely next to the wave, barely next to the circle. They'll be right-clicking, right-clicking, and as soon as that circle, like, hits right here, they'll right-click, let it move that extra, like, 200 units or whatever, and then immediately back up and not draw aggro. So if you want to get better at something, something you can, like, practice in, like, your pubs and everything, is you know, practicing that aggro circle. Okay. Gotcha. Because if you mess up, it's a little bad, because then you fuck the creep of Caribbean and everything. Right, right. Something that's a lot more difficult to do, but yeah, you can look out for it. So you, you went for level 3 heal. Uh, it's not terrible, honestly, because you're not going to be getting kills in this lane. But typically, um, in like a normal lane, you want to go level 3 splinter and then go heal. So you can just I be stronger. ended up feeling the uh, need for the, the heal because both of those heroes are actually difficult for Wyvern to deal with, especially Hoodwing. So I felt like so if we're going to be under tower a lot like this, then I feel like heal might be a little bit more helpful. I don't know. That was just my thought process in the moment. Yeah, that's great. I, I think it's fine. Um, also, when you Q, make sure you really you hit both heroes before you start focusing one hero. Because it's really important to get the debuff on both heroes. Okay. That's a good W. Oh. Bit of rotation for the mid lane Bloodseeker. Okay. Um, I don't think there's really anything you could have done there any differently. I think you could have maybe threaded the needle a bit more on the AM, see if he lived. Um, without embracing him. But he ended up living anyways. So you got your boots. So you're, this is like when you get very strong as a support is when you have your boots because you, you're able to maneuver a bit better. So right here. So right here, honestly, in my mind, you have to kind of be aware of like, okay, this guy just uses net. And this guy is the only guy with like abilities right here. 
And kind of what you want to do in this lane, you have to be aware of like what your carry wants to do, is this carry wants to mana burn the Earthshaker so he can't W as much, right? Mm -hmm. So as a Wyvern, you're like, okay, I need to recognize that. And hopefully this AM doesn't blink in, but what you can do is I would immediately Q and W, I slow this guy, I wouldn't commit like a Blood Bomb or anything, and let this guy hit him as much as possible. You're not going to kill him, but you're going to make this AM's lane easier, just because this Hoodwink used net. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, like, another example could be, like, bottom, let's say. Let's say this Nyx is trading with the Ogre, like, in the here or something, and your axe. Let's go to a spot where they're... My god, they never had Creeper Caribbean at all for the Dire. Alright, never mind. They never get the creeps passed over here. Anyways, if the Nyx and the Ogre are over here trading, and the Axe is just chilling right here hitting creeps, and let's say this Ogre's like holding on to his abilities, and the Nyx all of a sudden uses his Q to try and trade better at the Ogre. So, a way to capitalize that is that since he used his only defensive spell, and you have plenty of capabilities of killing this Nyx assassin, as a lane, you should both, one of you guys should communicate, like, hey, let's kill this Nyx. You know, Battle Hunger is used, and, you know, Fire Blast is used, and the Spectre can't do anything because he's a weak laner, and the Nyx dies. That's just kind of like a universal way of thinking about lanes. Is that you should always be aware of how your enemy is using their spells and what those spells do for them. Mm, okay. So, so for this hoodwink, this bushwhack is great for securing kills, and it's great for defending this earthshaker. So, since he used that, I don't even know where we were. Yeah, well, I'd like to go back to where we were there. He was level four. I knew that. Right there. That was a good... Oh, yeah, we did not kill the Hoodwink yet. That was a good use of... That was a good way of, like, how he was supposed to use Bushwhack right there. He used it defensively, is how he should have. I think he just used it. Right there, that's where he used it. So he used it right here to try and get a kill. It was obviously wrong, right? He didn't get a kill. All right. So within those 14 seconds after you use it, this lane is vulnerable. If this Earthshaker actually understood how the lane worked, and like you know, understood that if he was a good player, his first thought should be, "I'm not gonna get too close. I'm gonna aggro these creeps away, so that you know the, that you can't use all the spells on him." And that he can't, you know, mana burn. But, you know, that's a good deny. So I see you're good enough to know that denying is pretty important. Especially range creeps. So this is a great... That was a great... Opportunity. So right here, you notice that Hoodwink was really out of position, and he just uses W. That's an example. He just uses W, and they're going to be, you know, weak for five seconds. I don't know if you inherently... Maybe you did see that he uses W, and that's why you went. Maybe you didn't. But now you know I, it was, that... It was a positioning thing. I, I went based on the positioning. Yeah, and that's great. They were too far up. So you, you do have a great knowledge of positioning. But why it truly went so well is that this guy's W is on cooldown. It's all about a balance. And that you had all your spells ready. Because if his W wasn't off cooldown, he goes right here, W's, fissures, and does 400 damage to AM and this Hoodwink lives. And then you just lose a trade. You lose a blood grenade. This AM's low and your lane isn't as great as it used to be. But still very great that you recognize his positioning is bad. So, how do you feel like your lane? How should like 
how do you feel like your lane is going right now after that kill? Mm, like for... Better. Better. Not the uh, best, but just a little better. Okay. It's going pretty good. So one of the things that some people, even at my rank, don't really understand is how to abuse lanes. Like, how to know when you're strong and just really abuse, like, every advantage you got. So now that this Hoodwink is dead for 16 seconds, he's dead for 16 seconds, do you think this Earthshaker is allowed to be anywhere near these creeps? Nope. No. So your job is to just... You have boots of speed, so you can run away from him. But it's just to simply... This isn't your guys' board, right? No. It's just to simply make sure he doesn't get a pull off. Because if he's a great three, if he's a good three player, he's going to be able... He, he would pull this back since he is weak. And he doesn't want to go up to contest right now. Your job is to go here and just to scout out the Earthshaker. Make sure he's not coming into lane. And if he does, then this AM will blink on him and kill him. Because this Hoodwink is dead. Right, he's, he's, he's weak right now too, so... Yeah. So, your lane is really strong right now, and right right here, right here, you use this spell, and you go in, right? Which is exactly what you guys do, which is perfect. Oof. Yeah, they do, they do a lot of damage to me. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a bit rough. You you can always say like me your positioning was bad or something, but you would have never guessed at this. I mean you could have, but you couldn't have guessed that they were gonna be able to get that off on you so fast. So this is like danger mode right here. If I'm a carry and I see that my offlaner has a double stack in their hard camp, I'm just sweating because I know that it's one thing if they get a hard camp pool with one stack. But if they get a hard camp pool with two stacks, that instantly that clears the entire wave. Right. There's there's certain hard camps that can clear like an entire creep wave with just one like with no stacks. An example would be the bears, like the the fucking hell bears, and the the dark troll summoners. These guys. But if you have a centaur or like those bird. Fuckers, I don't know what the fuck they're called. They won't clear an entire wave. So if they get a hard cam pull off, typically they'll maybe deny like two melee creeps, maybe three. But what ends up happening is it actually pushes out your lane and it goes under your tower as a carry, which is really nice. Especially if you're losing the lane. But after the stack, it gets really scary because not only can they pull once, and clear twice. wave, but they can pull twice. And it's really hard for you to contest because, you know, these guys are really strong. Yeah, isn't that the, the skeleton spawning creep? I yeah. I remember the name of it. Yeah. The, that combination of creeps, too, is they do so much damage together. So, probably your focus right here is you can probably sneak a, a pool right now. They do have a ward, but you don't know about it. You can maybe sneak a pool. Like, sit here, Q, hit this, and then they come up and intercept the creeps right here. Typically, that's pretty hard for a support to interfere with. But other than that, you, that's one of your options. Another option you can do is just be hyper vigilant of the timings. I know really good supports are, like, super aware of when, like, the exact clock time as to when to right click these creeps they'll go up and right click these creeps to take them this way so that they can't pull over here it fucks up their pool you know about that yeah i just i just need to start doing it so yeah like at this point i would probably like right now they're not gonna pull because your creeps are right here but when your am fixes it or you get a pull off or something of that nature um Exactly. Then they're gonna then they're gonna pull and you can't really do anything about it. You'll just die. Yeah. Because you remember how like I said you can right click the heroes and then they'll follow you. Right. Yeah. Well, when you right click the heroes instead of one camp right clicking you, it's gonna be two camps right clicking you and it's gonna be hurting. So. 
Right. Those are your two options. So let's see how the lane plays out from there. Another thing I'm kind of forgetting about is I don't know if you really know too much. Like you, you know about lotus pools and everything, right? Yeah, every three minutes. Yep, these are very important in lane. So every three minutes, typically, you should be kind of fighting for it. Um, do you usually do that? It doesn't happen enough. I'll tell you that. <laughs> for this lane, you probably shouldn't though. Because not only do they have one way to cancel the channel for the Lotus Pool, but they have two, well, three. And they they'll. Have a lot of stun. Yeah, they have lots of stun and they'll kill you. The only way you'll do that is if you either you sneak it, like you notice they're out of position and you sneak it, or they're just low and weak. And it's very important because that's 125 mana and HP that you can give to yourself and use your mana. Remember, your mana is a tool to trade for their HP. So the more mana you have, the more HP they lose. Um, and also gives you mm. HP. Like, it's just... It's great. It's like... It can be lane winning. Like, especially, like, Undying. Undying's biggest thing... As a 5... Is that if he gets that Lotus Pool, he gets to decay probably two more times. And then trade even more. Undying is the definition of trading mana for HP. Because <laughs> he queues That's and they lose HP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um... So he wants as much mana as possible. Another good hero that's a good example of mana for HP is Skyrath. Skyrath, the more mana he has, the more mana region he has, the more he can just spam his abilities to make you lose HP. It's that way for every hero, it's just in different capabilities. Mm -hmm. AM doesn't, something, you know... What? Yeah, sorry, uh, something I know that you, that works on Wyvern, but it's hard to, like, set up, is that you can identify the enemy range creep being just far enough away from the rest of the creep wave to splinter blast the enemies without pushing the wave. But it's it's hard for that, that particular situation to come up frequently enough to use it a lot. That is, that's a great tool to use, especially when you hit level 3. So at this point in the lane, your Animage has a Vanguard. Um, this is also being aware of like how your carry is doing. You have to look at your lanes always through your eyes and your carry's eyes. It's the same way for your carry, too. Your carry also has to look through your eyes. Because you guys are both a team in this lane. So you see that your, your AM has Vanguard. He's a lot stronger. He's not as you know easily killable. He has HP, he has region, and he has block from damage, which the Air Shaker does. So right now, the AM is in a pretty good oper cr pretty good space. He's not going to be able to get killed. He can pull the creeps. He he'll be fine. As a support, you can look around the map. You can be like, okay, you're not going to be able to really kill mid. And he's a fucking troll mid laner. <laughs> and you're not really a great hero to gank. But not in level six anyway. Yeah, you don't really need level six to kill, but it's great to have. Um, but there's there's other things to do that aren't in your lane. Another one that's really really important is this thing right here, or this thing. But your job as the the hard support is to look at that, look at this clock. At two minutes and forty seconds, you you go Lotus at uh. 5 minutes and 40 seconds, you think Lotus. And at 6 minutes, right after you get this Lotus, you go all the way up here, sit behind this tree, or all the way, you go through this bridge, sit in these trees, and at 6.58, you walk out and you contest for that Wisdom Rune. Typically, in your, in your ranked games, these players aren't good enough to go to the Rune at seven, at seven minutes on the dot. But that's basically a free tome for you and your pause four. And what that means is that you're able to get curse faster. And I mean, he gives a fuck about the ogre. He gets multicast faster, I guess. But that will like boast the fuck out of both your lanes. 
And if your hard support, if your soft support's good, he's going to be running to the wisdom room as well to contest the seven minutes. So that's kind of one thing I forgot about. Um, at seven minutes, your lane was kind of hectic, so you couldn't really leave too much. Yeah. But definitely getting those wisdom runes is very, very important at seven minutes on the dot. And if you die for it, it is what it is. You can try and deny yourself to the ancients. You can run up, deny yourself, deny yourself. Um, but if you get that wisdom rune, it's it's very worth. Just tell your carries like, hey man, I'm getting the XP rune, BRB. The carry, if he's good, doesn't die. He doesn't like take any like risky CSs or anything. But yeah, something else very important in this game. After that, after the seven minute rune, you can always think about the fourteen minutes. Um, typically, you're not gonna get away with it twice. But if you're like a hero, I don't know if you play like IO or if you play, I don't know, if you have, yeah, just IO basically is the only hard support, or Bounty Hunter. Those heroes are very good at taking Wisdom Runes, and you, you should probably do it at 14 minutes as well. But Okay. Definitely I'm trying to get a pull here, but Dota said no. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you seriously didn't get, well, it's probably because you slowed them. Oh, that's rough. <laughs> that's really rough. I was actually salty about that. <laughs> I would imagine. So this is great. So, let's see. Did the Hoodwink show? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a good example. I don't know if you started attacking him because you saw the Hoodwink was mid. But that's the correct thing you should be doing here. You're attacking away from the creeps. And you're taking HP, and he is getting away from the creeps. That's you abusing the lane for how you should. Do you play Dota for fun? Uh, Are you playing Dota to like as a something to get better personally, or you could, you could say yeah. My goal is to reach Ancient and trying to get there as a Wyvern specialist. So okay, it's been a very difficult path. <laughs> Granted, this hero, I have 3,000 3, games and it hasn't gotten any easier. Alright. <sighs> it's it's these little moments right here where, like, I'm unsure how to be efficient. Like, you see a little bit of nothing going on right now. I'm trying to just, like, soak up XP a little bit to get 6, but, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to be efficient there. So, you have a couple of tasks on your mind. You probably saw the small camp was being blocked. It got blocked probably like two or three minutes ago. You can do that, or you can stand right here, press Q, and hit this, and try and get a pull-off, since the creeps are kind of in, in this area. Um, you can press Q and right-click these guys, you know, get your AM to get some mana break shots on them. So it's all about understanding your lane. Like, there's a couple of things you can do. You can just kind of get lost in the sauce a bit. I understand that. So I know that when I was probably, like, when I was 4K or 5K, yeah, somewhere in that area, MMR, and I was playing against players who were, like, 7K and 8K and all these high-ranked players, like, on my teams, um, I would very much get lost in the sauce. I'd, I'd be, like, I, I'd, like, get wrapped up in my own head, and I wouldn't know what to do. Um... And I don't really know how I overcame it, because it's definitely a mental block. But you just have to keep yourself. You just have to keep a clear head. This is also such a strange build. I will say. I don't know about that one. This troll's a bit strange, but he's a grandmaster troll. So <laughs> maybe I just don't know. Yeah. The, <laughs> speaking of like doing things that are a little bit weird. The uh, my itemize my items is something I wanted to talk about and kind of get your input because I know okay. there's like what you're supposed to do via the meta, but for my situation, I'm trying to make Wyvern work when she shouldn't work technically. So I develop a very unique playstyle. I build Blink Dagger Four Staff every game um, because the movement allows me to do what I need to do in order to to, to make her work for my for how I like to play. Those are good items. I think those are fun. Um, let's see. It's Every game is very different. There's no one set items that you're going to buy every time. And that's the correct way to do things. 
Um, damn, that was a really cool half pull. I don't even know if you tried to do that on purpose. It was intentional. I just didn't think it would happen the way it did, but I was <laughs> trying to half pull. Um, but yeah, like I said, you want to go over there and get some finish off the wave at least. I have, I have, uh, Ooh. yeah, that's the reason why I get a little bit. <laughs> uh, that's one of the things that I'm, I have hard time. You're saying that I need to be over there, but I get antsy when um, I see my core pushed far up like that, and it makes me want to like be near him. So usually, you standing right here is typically going to do nothing different than from you standing right here. Because you'll be standing right here. You have a long range. You'll be attacking it from over here. You don't have to stand over here. You just have to stand over here. Mm -hmm. The only difference is you're standing closer to the Echo. <laughs> I mean, like maybe you can get a Cold Embrace faster, but in that scenario, you're not going to... That AM is not not going to survive that. Um, and then you get Golden XP out of it. Get your yeah, six yeah, faster. I wouldn't be dead here, too. That's, that's another thing. So that's another thing. You kind of have to look at the... So, typically, if I was a carry here, um, I would understand that there's a Nyx on the enemy team, and I'd always be keeping track of, like, Nyx's levels. And typically, I, I would buy myself a sentry for the lane, because I know that a Nyx is going to be looking to kill me, or was this Nyx 5? Yeah, it was 5. Me or the mid laner. But mid lane is usually harder because there's always going to be sentries there. So it's a bit uneasy. So typically he's going to go for the carry or his opposite lane. Because he's not going to be able to kill an axe. So, you know, this AM isn't going to be as smart to buy himself his own sentry. I think you just played a sentry down. Yeah, you just did at the last moment, I think. Let's see. You just place it down after. So you you have to understand that there's Nyx in the enemy team. Nyx is going to hit six. Nyx is probably going to run into your lane. It's always great to have a sentry yeah, in that I, lane. I even I even said it my bad to the AM because I knew I should have <laughs> had it down. That's okay. You just have to understand kind of like lane tempo. You know how other lanes are doing. Like. Let's say, you know, ever since the introduction of these twin portals, let's say bottom, like Spectre and Nyx are crushing it. They have like six kills in the lane, yada yada. This you should expect this Nyx to show up through this twin portal to come and like kill this lane. In a higher MMR game. I don't know about these games, but mm -hmm. it's all about like lane tempo and paying attention to other lanes. Let's say you're playing against a Storm Spirit, right? Storm Spirit's enemy team. He's doing, like, pretty decent. And it's eight minutes, and you notice that he got the rune and that your mid laner didn't. At that moment, you should, as a support, be thinking, okay, this Storm Spirit's probably going to come top and kill, and I don't have, like, you know, vision. You do have vision. But, you know, I do or I don't have vision. I should position myself in a way where I can save my AM or even tell my AM to be a bit careful. Um... So that I wish that worked all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but just say even just like I don't know, position yourself right here, stay out of vision. So you can cold embrace the AM and so you can deep, or blink away, whatever. So it's all about paying attention not only your lane but other lanes as well. Mm -hmm. So I only made that, I only made that comment because I had a, a game recently where the lane went bad and I I literally foresaw them diving the tower and I told my Ricky to leave about 10 seconds before we both died. <laughs> yeah. Leave. But that's just an experience that I had. Yeah, I knew they had that, so I didn't commit too hard for it. I'm starting to get to the part of the game where uh, I don't think I played well. <laughs> it's okay. That's what these games are for. So maybe did you did you notice this fight happening a bit sooner or like at that moment? Um, like did you see it bit, and you're like I'm not gonna join in or he's like oh fuck now they're at the secret shop now I'm gonna join in. Like, what was your thought well, process? It didn't feel logical to fight there. You're right, but sometimes teams are just really dumb, and 
you positioning yourself like right here or something can maybe save the troll, maybe not. You don't have to commit yourself and die, but maybe there's like a sick curse opportunity. You're able to curse the low earth shaker and he dies. If I remember correctly, I think I was like focused on trying to get that stack with AM because there's a lot of creeps and he's not like that strong yet. So my thought process was like, we need to get the stack while they're not here so we can get the XP. So somebody else just told me that um, that if you ever feel like you're doing nothing in the game, you can always stack. Which is true. You can always stack. Okay. Um, it's okay. definitely, it's a very like easy answer for like lower MMR players to just stack. Especially for the Axe. Because the Axe can take stacks really well and he uses that gold as kind of like a springboard for his tempo. He gets a faster blink dagger and everything. Um... There's no easy double stacks in your area. You can't double stack, but if you're on Radiant, you can stack pretty easily right here. Right, yeah. Um, can, but yeah. You can do it in uh, the top triangle, but you need a ward. I found out. Like, right here? You can, or with right Wyvern's uh, uh, on Dire. dire um, not triangle, but jungle. You can do a double stack, but you need vision. With yeah, you can do it right here. Uh, if you were to press Q and hit this, hit this at like four seconds or something, I think you'd be able to get it. Um, but that's just really far away from the lane, and typically you want to like stack close to the lane. Like if you're, let's say your pause four is a winter wyvern, and you have an axe in your lane, probably starting at like three or four minutes, you should go over here and double stack, probably almost every minute, because that gives axe solo XP, which he benefits greatly off of. And he's a very sustainable laner. Obviously don't do it if he's low and he's having trouble, but... <laughs> there's, there's things you can do. Ooh, pure damage. Um, yeah. I got yelled at a lot. I mean, I should have muted, but... The, the, the guys yelled at me a lot because I wasn't eing when Nick Oh, was it, that didn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's pure damage. It goes straight through. I said that, but... You have to also, the part of the mental thing is that whenever, like, you know, some somebody's stressing you out in any pub, it's just mute. Like, you might miss out on comms or something, but trust me, it's just not worth your blood pressure spiking for some guy who thinks he's God's gift to Dota. He's trying to tell you what to do, and you're just like, oh, he's not having it. The game is supposed to, this is a, you know, this is a video game after all. Right. You're trying to have fun, and if you're not having fun, you know, and improving and playing the game, then there's no point in playing it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for the kind words. <laughs> I wanted to ult here, but obviously, not really. That was a great ult. Um... Typically, so your positioning in that fight was a little bit bad. And what I mean by that is that you're getting really close. And I don't know, it's just, I think just lower MR players have issues with positioning themselves. But you, you notice how you're kind of moving closer to over here. You should be kind of moving closer to these trees or anything to help you kind of like back out of the fight if you need to. But you got this sick curse which actually is pretty great so that helped you out so wasn't terrible also axe killed the specter bottom so not the end of the world so probably right here you're probably thinking you, you don't really know what lane to go to you don't really know what to do right yeah exactly um it feels very awkward at this in, uh, right now typically if like, as a support, a lot of issues with some supports is that they feel like they're not supposed to take farm or XP, which is not, not true. Um, that is something I need help a lot in. So, uh, there's, like, there's a skill as a support to understand that, like, where to farm, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Your answer is mid lane right now. You kind of look at the map. AM's kind of taking over this this area. These two are taking over this area. 
all you have to do is by the time you walk here, there'll probably be like a creep wave with two range creeps. And then you'll get that for free because you're right next to your tower. And nothing's happening on the map. So whenever there's nothing happening, you can either do that or you can stack. You can do both. You can stack right here and then come do this. There's never a moment where you're not, you can't be efficient. You don't always have to be fighting and warding and doing support stuff. You can also be doing that and getting items. Because you getting a blink dagger sooner is really nice to your team. It's not just, you know, it's not like 2013 Dota where supports are just, you know, buying wards, buying carrier, all this stuff. Right. So it looks like you're doing that. The troll does run mid, but this is where you can go stack. Or you can go, you have plenty of time to go triangle and do a double stack. And stacking is OP now because it gives you XP bonus and gold bonus. So if you're, st if you're standing right here, like you stack these both these things twice, you can get probably like half a level to a level of XP, which is huge for you because you're one of the few pause fives that really benefit off of levels on all of your spells. Okay, there we go. So your E is a little bit higher. Oh, you're mid animation for that too. That's rough. A lot of people don't realize that cast range is a thing. Yeah. Wait, pressure R? Why didn't you ult? Can I get there first, please? Thank you. <laughs> like, dang. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um. Okay. So you're kind of in this moment where you're like, I don't really know what to do. You can go stack. Yeah. It's fifty. It's fifty seconds right now. This ogre's kind of taking your farm. You can. You don't really have any like playmakers on your team that are really making plays right now. Typically, if you had like a mid laner that was playing a normal hero, you'd probably want to play with him. Um. You know, both these towers are taken, which is good. So there's not really anything you have to go and take towers. You can try and take this tower if you like get a kill. But you know. This guy's probably just gonna farm jungle. When we played our end house last night. What, what hero was I playing? Monkey? Snap? I can't remember. You were playing I was playing Monkey King. So looking at this game, imagine there's like a team fight and there's all five heroes. Who do you want to curse? either silencer. Muerta, or um, if the position gives it to you, to me, then Monkey King too. Yeah, so it's gonna be situationally. It's gonna be situational always, right? It could yeah. be that I'm like half HP, or the Dragon Knight's half HP, or Timber. Usually, is never the best person to right. curse. But um, typically, if you're gonna initiate with curse, you'd want to go on the Silencer because he has a really big spell and if he dies boom no no global so in this game probably like hoodwink if she's ever out of position or nyx yeah other than that it's just pretty situational Yeah, so I was kind of thinking about it for a second, is that when you fight, okay, you did actually check the high ground, I don't know if you meant to, but... I did, I did, yeah, it was a ward there. Um, there was? Like when you went up there? I think so, right? That was my whole reason to go up there, I think, to check to see if there was a ward. So typically... It's a little hard. You were kind of. I think you were like thinking about cold embracing him there. I was but... silenced. I was, I was trying to heal him sooner. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of. It's hard. It's hard. This this ability is really hard to like tell when to use it. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm fully aware. <laughs> so. You you have to use it either to heal someone or to protect someone from physical damage. The delay. Right. And typically, 
protecting somebody from physical damage is never, usually never the case. It, it'll end up griefing that person rather than, you know, letting them live. So, if someone is, like, stunned, per se, you would cold embrace them because they're stunned anyways. Let's say I get arrowed. Just put me in cold embrace while I'm arrowed because then I don't take physical damage and I'm healing. And, like, right. during a team fight. So, here, he can't do anything. So I would have instantly cold embraced him since he was low HP anyways. And I, you say you said you were gonna use it, and I believe you. So, um, but yeah. Also, you're pretty low HP. The the reason why I held it just briefly is because I was waiting for Bloodseeker to come in so that I could get it off. Yeah, I, I knew I'd be able to get it off with no issue if he showed up, but I didn't want to do it early to make, so it would get the full duration. If he's going to right click, but they were all there, so it ended up not mattering. That was my thought process in the moment. I, I should have, if I was more, but if I didn't feel like shit, <laughs> I think yeah. I'd have been more uh, cognitive to be aware of the Nyx being there. So, right here, yeah, there we go. That was a great curse. So, oh yeah, so this part, I, I was clicking away, but my hero wasn't going the direction I wanted it to go. That's just um, because there's, all this was blocked off and you're clicking right here. And then the way that Dota works is they take the path that's shortest to that spot. So since you're right here, it's not going to go all the way around this fissure to come here. It's going to come right here. No. So you probably yeah, should just click okay. right here. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it just felt like I could go back to those little trees there. I don't know what I was doing. So, if you want to get better a lot faster, like if you want to learn, my my recommendation is um, is definitely like every time an in-house pops up, I don't want you to be nervous about it. I don't want you to be anxious about it. I want you to like hop in that in-house. And I don't want you to be nervous about playing well. I want you to be, you know, excited, you know, have fun. And... These players, like some of them, like to micromanage a little too more than others, a little too much more than others. But they'll give you great advice, especially Legacy. Legacy is a pretty good player. Um, he just micromanages a little bit too much and kind of gets upset. Mm -hmm. To be fair, some players do make a lot of mistakes in those in houses, and you know it is what it is. But the best way for you to kind of get out of the strut is to get you out of these pubs. These pubs create really bad habits because you're surrounded by troll mids and just all these weird, weird heroes. Typically, if you're going to play an in-house, you're going to be playing against people who are good, against people who will, you know, with people who will help you. And that's just going to refine you even more. That's probably the best way to get you out of, like, your strut or whatever you're having. Just play these in-houses. I just don't even care if you win or lose. Just play the game. Have fun. Play some Winter okay. Wyvern. Yeah, I'm totally down with that. Yeah, like Wyvern's the reason why I play Dota. I like the challenge of how intricate she is, and um, just her play style is really fun. Getting those ultis when, you, especially when you get a really good ult. Oh, it feels so good. <laughs> it's a, do a dopamine spike. Just ruptured an axe illusion. All right. Um, I haven't really seen you ward too much. Is it just the ogre was buying all the wards or something? Yes, yes, he was buying all of the wards, and I get I get pinged and com they constantly you know complain about me not having wards. Every time I looked at shot, there was none to buy, and I <laughs> looked multiple times. It was very frustrating. Typically, if that happens, I would just put in your quick buy, so you can see it as soon as it pops up. Um, there's something that, like, some supports like doing, and I think it's more of, like, an, a situational type thing, is to have sentries on you, like, have at least one sentry and one ops on you at all times, so that, like, when a fight starts, you can just place it down on, like, the high ground or something. Okay. Um, so, like, here, for example, like, 
if you guys are want to push this tower, you you can have an obs right here. Place this down, and then you have all this vision. Do you know kind of like the intricacies with like high ground vision, when to place and when to not? Um, I understand some basics about it. I know that they're good for fighting, and um, if you need vision for basically like you just said for pressuring a tower here, um. So do you right, typically yeah, kind of place it down? Oh, did you get knobs? I didn't see you get it. I was just curious, because a lot of supports don't understand wording. Like, yeah, when... that, like Yeah, for, for team fighting for especially, is when I, when I will for sure use a high ground without, like, hesitation. If there's a team fight either about to break out or, or breaking out, then I'll throw the obs on the high ground. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, there's, there's other ways you can also use it. So typically in your pubs, um, you're not going to get a lot of, what's the word? Like you're not going to get, people aren't going to understand the flow of the game as well as you might want them as a support. So let's say in a magic, like another magical game, right? You have a great safe lane, your mid lane's killing it. It's mid game. And you have like a you know a team that's just killing it on the die, right? You guys are putting the pressure, everything. You guys just got Aegis from, let's say, the dire side. It would be amazing to place down Vision here, right? Because you know your team is going to inhibit this side of the map and then try and kill these two towers. And if anyone tries to come to you ward it, they'll die. So you can do it for, I'd say, like, three separate reasons. The one we just talked about, where, like, a team fight's about to happen, you place it down so we get good vision. Two, you want to control a part of the map that cannot, that you know that the ward can't get dewarded because they'll die if they try and deward it. Typically, this is not, like, this, this cliff right here gets dewarded really fast, but if you're team is like actively pushing this and then actively pushing this, th this will never get awarded. But as soon as you guys leave or something and go like here or something, it's going to get awarded. So it's very short lifespan. And the third reason is you think that the enemy team is not going to suspect it. And this is a little harder. You need to have a little bit more game sense to understand like when a team you think is not going to expect a high ground ward. Um, there's a little, there's a nice little trick actually. Uh, for this ward right here in particular, this ward spot in the early game, mm -hmm. uh, is that, <laughs> let's say you're Radiant, right? And you know that the Dyer placed a sentry here and didn't get a ward, and they didn't place an observer on here. That would be an example of when you should place an obs here, like really sneakily. You know why? Because okay. they won't they won't have vision of the high ground. So. Yeah, and they're not going to check again. So then you're going to have basically a full duration ward here because they think it's just there's no vision there, unless they are like I don't know playing disrupt their CM or Jakira where they can check the high ground. So you can even use kind of like how like the enemy team is like how the enemy team is playing to even suspect where they might have vision, and you can either do two things: you can either deward that vision. Or you can play on the in a different side of the map, play where they don't have vision. Okay. So there's lots of intricacies and you know things that you'll just learn as you go on. Learn through houses. So much. Thanks again. No problem. As we get oh, into yeah. more in the mid game and late game, it kind of gets. There's not too much to talk about typically. Other than that axe, not using calling blade. I think your biggest time. issue... So that was great. This is actually very great. This is an example we just talked about. Is that your team is now inhibiting this area. And you guys want to take that tower, so you place a ward here. And you get you deward it as well. That's great. Um, Typically, though, for your sentries, try and place them in trees. So that they won't be seen as easily. And then they cover both this area and this area for the Knicks. Okay, gotcha.
it's a bit rough. So probably the best way to deal with Nyx in this scenario is to stand by somebody close. Okay, let's see how you take this fight. So that's actually perfect. That was a really good job. So actually, so I will say this. Um, the most attractive target here is the Earthshaker because he is low, but who is a better target? The Bloodseeker. Exactly. This Bloodseeker would have died, and then this Earthshaker would have died after him because he's already low. Mm -hmm. So right, yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't give myself more time to think. Yeah, I understand. Some things like happen in the moment, but it's just something that you can. It's something that's like, uh, what's the word? Like a shadow bias, or um, the... I'm not. I can't remember. Hindsight. Hindsight. You mean? Hindsight bias. There you go. It's it's hindsight bias, but you know, looking at it now, you'll probably think in the future. Plus, you do damage into curse. Yeah. Kind of curious as your team is very split. This troll probably has TP. He does. Yeah. Don't worry about this game, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I guess and the biggest thing to take away is to mute when you need to mute. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't mute in this game. This axe was unbelievably toxic to me. Just like, you can even tell them, like, just, hey, man, I'm muting. Just not even as, like, toxic. Just let them know. Because then, then they calm down because they're not constantly trying to talk to you. <laughs> right. So why'd you have smoke here? Um, it was a little bit of muscle memory. I like to smoke to get an award, but then I realized I don't have any awards, so I'm just kind of here awkwardly now. Yeah. That's what. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> that's okay. Kind of playing the space a little bit. Um. Oh yeah, it's. I, I remember this part. Oh <laughs> man, the Dies team again. is just not really helping at all. Usually, like typically, I don't know. This is why Nyx is very strong at lower levels, is because Nyx isn't really punished for doing the things he does. Yeah. Uh, maybe if the if maybe if Ogre just chilled on the wards a little bit, I can maybe have a sentry on me a little more. Because when I'm dealing with heroes like Nyx, I do try my best to have more detection on me more frequently. But when the sentries are strained really hard, I tend to not have a ward on me because I'm not like checking ward shop every five seconds. Yeah. You also put in your quick buy like I told you earlier. That's also a nice way to do it. Um, Another thing that'll be very good for you and something that you'll gain MMR in your pubs is to use your smokes conjointly with your team. Because typically when you tell someone to do something at like a lower rank, like you tell this axe like, hey, let's go play here. Right? He's not going to listen. Smoke of Deceit has this magical power to make anybody just listen to you. <laughs> I don't know how it works. Okay. It's great because it also, you know, it's great for ganking, but it also it's just great. It, it unifies the team. People listen. It's like I don't know. It's like if you, especially with someone like Axe on your team, if you just smoke with the Axe and you find the Bloodseeker, the Bloodseeker dies. Like anybody dies if you find them, right? Right. Typically, maybe not the Spectre because he's really tanky, but anybody that you'll find will die with just the Axe and maybe I don't know the Ogre or something. So. Take advantage of that in the mid game and just like, you know, let's say, you know, especially in a time like this where the lanes are pushed out and like you know, somebody has to farm this, right? It's getting pushed in. You can smoke, go into here, get a ward down, like right here when you're smoking. That's another good example of high ground ward. And then find someone and kill someone. So that's something else you should probably think about a little bit more support. Is kind of be you're kind of like a playmaker. Kind of use your use your team as like tools. This is the fight I was talking about. My team got mad at me because I was trying to kite the Nyx because I couldn't tell where he was. There was no sentries available. I 
pop dust to try and see if I could catch him. But he didn't show up, so I started kiting immediately. So that I could maybe position to reposition for an ulti. But Arctic Burn was down, and it was this awkward position. I couldn't really get to them. Yeah, okay, so I, I kind of see what you mean. So, let's see, let's go back from the beginning. All the way from the beginning. So, using your Q over here, it's probably, obviously, it was your first mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Because then it's on cooldown, and you're, you're not able to traverse the situation very well. Now, from right here, obviously, it's this guy's mistake for using his ult, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, he thought that was real. So, up to here, you've only m really made one mistake. Hello. Um... Then right here is where you kind of start to freak out. You kind of start right clicking. You, you kind of need to understand. You have to be more understanding of your position within the fight. Right here is typically good, but you went from standing right here, which you, your old range can reach, to standing right here, which it cannot reach anymore. And now you're under tower, right? So. This is just an issue of positioning. You understand that you're standing way too far away and you don't have, like, a blink. And I know you're scared of the Nyx, but the Nyx, you know, if he doesn't kill you, he's going to kill your team. Ah, oh, that's a good point. That's a very good point. You can also do something else where you can force staff, like, if you were to move your hero facing this way, you can force staff up here. You don't have to go all the way around here, but... Yeah, that's just an issue of positioning and defensive curse. So always, you're kind of a little tunnel focused right now because I think you're just kind of like, you're like, fuck, that was a shitty fight. Yeah, um, but you always need to pay attention that you're not always truly out of a fight. Something that like I'm pretty good at kind of like as a, as a player, is I'm very good at like threading the needle and going in and out of fights and just always being a presence in the fight when I shouldn't be. So this is an example here is that, you know, your AM is here and you're not necessarily going to die. Like your team came in the back line and just killed them all. Like, well, let's look. What the heck? I hate the spectator moment. <laughs> So, like, here, the curse wasn't really necessary. This is kind of like a... I don't know if it was like a panic curse. Like, I don't know. Like, what do you think it was? I didn't want to die again to Nyx, to be honest. Okay. I, I understand that. But he's not going to be able to catch you. You have Tranquils. Like, if he, he's going to have to run a long, long way, right? So, using this curse is, you know... Maybe it wasn't necessarily too bad because it allowed him to kill the Earthshaker, but he's got to be careful. At this moment right here, I would immediately like go this way as you, because I'm like, oh shit, my AM's in, he's about to go in. I'd go over here, or I'd go over here after they go here. The only reason I don't want to go this way is because I don't know if they have vision right here. If they have vision right here, they're going to see you and probably like dig on you or something, which they don't. <laughs> So I would, I would literally go back in, I'd maybe Q, like, those three guys, slow them, and, like, just, I would just continuously play in this area. If they want to chase you, they can chase you, and then the AM kills them, right? So oh, just make sure, sure, make sure that, like, in these fights, you're kind of, like, a nuisance, even if you're close to dying. Just, like, okay. you know, thread the needle. Obviously, don't do it, like, every time. Like, you, you have to be comfortable with doing it. In this situation, you could have maybe hit it on the Knicks. You could have hit it on the, you know, those three. AM could have gone in. All right, so let's see how you position yourself. All right, so typically in Roche fights, you can defend, you can position yourself three separate ways. Um, I'll do both. So I need to zoom out. All right, this is good. So there's three 
I guess, sort of ways you can prepare for a rush fight. Um, first of all, this is really rough on you because you guys don't have a sentry. Um, you need a sentry to place here to prepare for the Nyx. Mm -hmm. Prepare for maybe any potential like shadow blades. I don't know if they have any shadow blades or anything. It doesn't look like it. Um, but yeah, especially for Roche, you typically want to have a sentry here. Like right here where my cursor is because that covers this high ground ward right here right. that people would like to place um then the three different spots you can position yourself is i'll see if you can guess why these spots are are good all right first one is right here why do you think it's good i can't see you you're in the trees you basically are pretty safe in there yep that's true what's it was one more reason um you have well I don't really know what the next <laughs> it's okay um the the third reason is that those first three reasons are good, and that's very important, but the third reason is that it will pop their smoke right right duh. Ugh. so if this is a good team they're these idiots aren't ever gonna smoke in their life they're ever they're never gonna smoke, but in an in house or something and they like know that you guys are rushing, they're gonna wanna smoke and they'll either typically they don't go through here but they'll like go through here or whatever. A block smoke from both ways, and then they don't see where you are. Right, right. Um, if you have an OBS, an observer, and you're on dire, um, or even on radiant, typically this is what a lot of DPC teams will do is when they want to take Roche, they'll place an observer right here, and then they'll sit in the trees and they'll see if they broke smoke and they'll immediately leave. And then it lets your team know, like, you know, what's happening, basically. Okay. Um, all right, the second position that you can be in a fight typically is right here, and the, the the only way you can actually sit on this position and actually hold this position is if you know they don't have an observer here, and this is typically more of a defensive position, like you don't want to die, and you like want to, you know, want to get something off. Um... Okay. The third position, and this is like the greediest position that you can be in at this point, is back here. And why do you think this is... And this is more of like a more situational position based off what hero. Um, why do you uh, think it's good for Wyvern to sit back here? Counter-initiation. Exactly. So if, like, say they blink an echo... Immediately, if if someone blinkens and echoes and you're wyvern, you want to immediately curse them because that completely cuts off his combo of stuns, and it lets you reset the fight. So if you're, especially this game, if I was you, I I would know they're not going to smoke, and I would, and I know that Nyx is probably going to try and hunt me. I'd probably sit back here, and if the specter, let's say, haunts, don't panic. Just the first thing is you don't panic, press Q, run in the trees a bit so they can't see you because the specter or illusion can't go through trees. You is that high ground? Is that like a pillar thing right there? I guess it is. I get, you could literally sit on this pillar thing right here and the specter illusion would not be able to see you. And you can just hold this position. And then typically, you know, if they haunt, they're going to go in. So you'll be able to go in and haunt or go in and curse. Okay. So let's see how you do. So you get silence. That's a bit rough. You get the curse off. Wasn't the greatest curse, but it's kind of like something you're about to die. So it's good enough to just throw it out there. Might as well. <laughs> Stuff happening. So that's a good example of not cursing because it wasn't really huge. I was trying to get better at not pushing my buttons when I don't need to. Yeah, it's I'm a good skill. I'm decent at it, but... I will say your, your tunnel focus is a bit bad sometimes. Like, did you were you aware that this guy was getting jumped? Um, I think we were, but we were already backing out, and he wasn't. Okay. It's just his position. Oh, the ogre has two there. hearts, and he lived. 
is two hearts. <laughs> Welcome to Archon Bracket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alright. So, at this point, where you're kind of like, we're winning, don't know what to do. Like, you're just kind of like, I don't really want to farm. I want to, like, do something with my team. And you're kind of like, you're kind of in the middle of nowhere right now, right? Right, yeah. Very awkward. You kind of want to be attached to the hip with the core in, like, the fog. So, like, an example, like, example of this would be to, like, I don't know, let's say this troll is, like, farming in this area or something. And he's just, like, he's being a dumbass. Just sit, like, right here, somewhere, like, close to him, but not right next to him. So you can, like, Q and then ult or something and kind of initiate. Um... Or if you had observers, which you didn't really have observers at this point, you should place like a ward, like, you know, play with your team, place a ward, and then play in that area and allow your team to farm that area and maybe take a tower. Okay. Um, I don't really know what you guys do. It looks like the axe is getting gone on. So yeah, like, that's nothing you can do. I've never seen an axe die like that. Crazy. Is someone else about to die? So you're doing a good job, you're coming to him. It's a good job not cursing, I don't think that would have been a great curse. So that wasn't really necessarily a curse that needed to happen. You're, I think yeah, you're... you're right. I at this point, cold. you should cold embrace that guy. And the reason why is that is your cold embrace is strong as hell, Dugger, right? He's 6k max HP. You'd be healing at probably like 400 HP a second. <laughs> and he's ruptured, and he's kind of getting fucked on. So probably before you die, like I, I respect the TP attempt. That was actually kind of close. Um, but you could, you should probably cold embrace that guy because his rupture just finished. So this moment you're kind of like a bit awkward right now and it's not really your fault entirely it's just like everybody's so split across the map i would also be going crazy in this game that was a great curse You saved them, but um, that's just another example of positioning. Let's see how you could have done this better. See how close you were to this? I like that you placed the sentry, but you need to be, be a bit more opportunistic. You know what I mean by opportunistic? Not exactly. Going to deal. So opportunistic is meaning like you kind of have to wait for your opportunity to come in at the best moment. You're, this anti-mage isn't going to die right away. He might have a Nyx assassin kill him right away. But, like, you can sit... Like, if I were you, I'd probably, like, sit up here. Or maybe, like, Q and sit over here and just, like, wait to see what happens. Like, this guy isn't going to die. And, you know, he has blank and everything. And they can't really kill him super fast. But by you being right here, it makes you just as likely to die as he will. You just kind of panicked a little bit. You're like, oh fuck, he's getting haunted on. And you kind of go on the bud, right? It is what it is. But yeah, this is a great curse. <laughs> Skip. Oh, man. This Nyx is having a fun game. Right here, yeah. They wanted me to ult her so they could get the kill. But the rest of this team is missing. There's no vision. Uh, like, why am I going to ult here? It's okay to solo sometimes. If you need to, but not on a hoodwink. Like if it's like an A, like a bloodseeker running away, and your spells are that, all cooldown yeah. or something. Yeah, that I know. I just like I knew just it, this just wasn't it. This just just wasn't it. Like we just didn't have the position. So right now you're kind of at your strongest. Um, glimmer cape is actually not a bad item in this game. Glimmer, okay. Because you've been having a lot of issues with haunt. 
And if you get haunted on and you just glimmer, then they just can't see you. Typically, they won't see you, and you won't take as much damage from the haunt. So, True. these items are, are pretty good. Um, you probably don't need a four staff this game. Ghost scepters would be okay. Like, there's a couple items you need. Um, if you were to go on bracer, it would have been, been early game, and you would have had to been more farmed. Otherwise, it would have delayed. Pretty. Yeah, quick. the um, that's kind of what I mentioned earlier. The blink four staff is just a core part of my playstyle. I, I, I would. I def definitely could like work in some ways to like. Alter four staff's that. always great. Um. But you don't always have to go four staff first item. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Your team is just really funny. This would be a great opportunity to smoke curse. Yep, you go for it. So this is kind of another example of positioning. Um. Right here, you see a Nyx, right? You see Nyx? Mm -hmm. And then you see, like, two heroes over here. You don't really give a fuck about cursing the Nyx, per se. Because he, you know he's going to be alone over here. If I were you, I would immediately walk this way. Because you want to be in a good position to, to curse. Right here, right. it's a bit awkward. Because you have to blink curse, where you don't really need to blink curse. Mm, okay, I see what you're saying. Um... In this position, do you cold embrace the troll? Yeah. Did he ult? Yeah, so... I think... Oh, that's just really bad timing. You guys did it at the same time. So, <clears throat> typically... Typically... If, like, if I was the troll in this situation, and I saw that my BKB was on cooldown for, like, six seconds or something, I would communicate to you that I'd want to be cold embraced, so that I can then ult and BKB. So, by you cold embracing, I think you did the right thing, but he just panicked here. What's the key will let us see? That was a pretty good curse. Um, let's go back and see it. Be careful using your four staff aggressively like that. Typically, you want to use your blink aggressively, even on your four staff. This is this is kind of be used to. Uh... It was on cooldown. That's why I didn't. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> um, just typically no, you can always use it aggressively like that, but typically. In this scenario, we're on the high ground. You'll you'll have enough time to like walk up or even blink in and ult like that while maintaining your positioning. That's good. Hang on. This is a good embrace. I almost had early bad ulti. <laughs> we'll see. So, right here. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I will say that right here you should have cursed the Bloodseeker. Because this Bloodseeker's item build is kind of strange. Um, your, so your ulti, your, your curse, goes through BKB on whoever you're cursing, right? Right. So, one of the things that your curse is also great for is completely eliminating somebody's BKB duration because it lasts six seconds, or five seconds. And right here, not only is the Bloodseeker bkb but the Earthshaker is, like, doing his entire combo on AM. So you would have killed two birds with one stone. So it doesn't always have to be a sexy curse every time. It can be simply something like that where it disrupts the flow of the fight. Okay. Um, you could have probably embraced that guy, but he was dead anyways.
Okay. Um, so as a wyvern, your biggest strength is, or like something that you really need to get good at, is your laning. Because wyvern can really excel in laning if they know how to lane. If they know how to lane perfectly. Um, I'm not a, a wyvern expert, but what I'd recommend is to watch some... Find some sort of pause five winter wyvern gameplay in like immortal or something like pop immortal like ranked um not ranked like dpc players watch how they lane and watch how they use their spells and and try and think to yourself like why do they use your spells that way uh, another thing i would like to say is you should probably be last sitting a bit more you're really 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 poor for 55 minutes um Having items on you is just as good as having items on anyone else. That ward's nice, but probably should save it for high ground. Right, yeah. How often do you look at your map? Um, quite a lot. I, I use the mini map to avoid having to pan or scroll. Okay. So, like, if usually when I'm playing, like, if I were to like have a face cam on, probably I, I don't know. Typically, I'm looking at my map, like me. I'd say maybe around thirty to twenty percent of the time. Like, I will literally just, like, straight up, like, if I'm right here in your position and I'm walking towards here, I'd be looking at my map, walking towards the fight, so I can, like, see, okay, the Nyx isn't in the fight. Or, uh, I don't know, things like that. Right, yeah. So just be, just have awareness going into fights and picking up those crucial details. Be like, okay, Nyx isn't in this fight. I don't have to worry about getting two shot. You know, you don't have to because you have Aeon, but, you know, something like that. Right. That's a great curse. That's a perfect curse. So, I, I, may, I may have missed it, but what did you use the her, uh, your four staff on? So, you just gotta be a bit careful. You see how you used it to get away from the illusion? And he died because the real guy came. It's gotta be a bit oh, okay. careful on your how you use your force staff because it's a really long cooldown. The hell was that? Wait, what? Oh. Um. Oh. <laughs> uh, hey. I guess it makes a noise whenever I'm. Whenever somebody talks for the first time, I guess I don't know. Um. Anyways, what was I saying? The four staff, yeah. yeah so make staff. sure make sure you're using your four staff at like very like you can't use it greedily. Typically you don't want to use it aggressively. You kinda of want to use it either to save your team or you save yourself. Um kind of one of the things that like my friends make fun of me for is I'm known for saying like you know, when I'm in a bad situation, I just yell, four step, four step, four step, four step. I'll just say, like, four step over again. And just hope that somebody on my team has a four step to four step me out. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it's on funny. cooldown, you know, if it's on cooldown, I was like, what the fuck? You know, like, why'd you use your four step fade? <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, just make sure you don't use your four staff in that sort of manner. Because in this moment, you can maybe. Let's say you didn't use your force staff. You're gonna die anyways, right? Yeah. He is an abyssal, whatever. If you didn't use your force staff, what would have happened is I probably would have force staff this way or force staff this way. And what would have happened is it would have made the specter take ten seconds or seven seconds or even some sort of time, a longer period of time he is gonna spend on you to kill you. Rather than just killing you in two seconds and then going to kill someone else. So by you kiting, it's actually helping your team out a lot more. So just be a bit more careful on how you use your stuff. Okay. 
Oh, I see you bought. Oh, rough. <laughs> Dude, that, that moment was just like, I hate this game. <laughs> I would probably would have gone right maybe here. Usually what I do is if I buy VOTs like that, I look to see if there's Glyph. Because <clears throat> if you have Glyph, I'll like TP and then Glyph the wave. Ah, uh, um, okay, okay. But I probably would have TP'd here otherwise because I think it would have died. <clears throat> Alright. You can also take over any lane and press W on it. Experience and gold. Alright, let's see how you, how you control this fight. So right off the gate, you're very out and open, right? Mm -hmm. Um, as a wyvern, you don't have to be out and open. You're you don't do that much damage. Your Q does nice damage, but you don't do that damage. What you're looking for is a really good curse, right? Right. You don't want the enemy to know where you are. So, like, if you were to like TP in here and maybe like walk into here, your fog is your best friend as a wyvern. You always want to go into the fog. You can sit here in the fog, maybe press Q, hit them sometimes. You know. But you don't want to be out in the open, because, I don't know, let's say like a Nyx is right here, you get clapped. Let's say Spectre wants to haunt. He knows that you're away from the team. He'll haunt and kill you. You don't want to give them that sort of information. I mean, you guys win the fight, but just generally, like, practice your positioning during these fights. Okay. Noted. Good cold embrace. That's an okay four stuff. I like that you're holding on to curse though. You you held on to curse until you knew you needed to use it. That's a really good practice. What other what other neutrals do you think you had this game? Did you check? No, because I my, my mental health, my mentality wasn't quite there. It's okay. I, um, it's it's good practice. For Philosopher Stone, um, to use your Philosopher Stone, I guess like uh, what's the word? So have it in your backpack. There you go. Usually, yeah, when you get your backpack. tier three and your tier four items come up, um, you'll you'll get items that you want. You'll get um, what's that item called? It's level three item that boosts your intelligence, gives you cast range, pushes uh, people away. Headband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, if you get that item, you obviously want it. If you get bad items, you can just keep it. But tier 4, you're definitely going to get an item that you want. And the reason why you keep it in your backpack is so that when you die, you switch it into your neutral item slot so that when you're dead, you're getting plus, you know, 75 GPM. Or if you're just, like, farming around the map, you know, a fight's not going to happen. You can just keep it in there and get the extra GPM. Yeah, that thing has probably saved your, your gold this game the hell do i not okay there we go so at this point you don't have curse it's looking rough backing out is the right choice your team just didn't back out still get kills though at this point i'd be running straight back to your team probably you can force staff him out, you can call him Brace, you can save him from dying. You know, as long as you're safe in your positioning. Right. Alright, see how you cursed. Oh, I like that. It's kind of one of the things I like to do with Flink Dagger Force stuff. Look at that. So that is something I've never seen before, actually. <laughs> Omni said the same thing. <laughs> Damn. All right, Grandmaster Warden over or uh, went to Ryvern here. So, yeah, that was a really good play. Um, got an Earthshaker kill. He does not buy back. A lot of creeps in the base that aren't getting tended to, but. This is probably not really. No, just don't worry about it. So this is way better positioning, like million times better. Like you being right here, I don't know if you intentionally want to. You're thinking about it being right here, but this is really good. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I wanted to be here. It was gonna be a good spot for me. Okay, so that was way better. Way better. They call GG. So I probably would have cursed right there. All kind of happened really fast. Yeah, I definitely missed the window for it pretty hard. I probably would have forced after your axe out instead of yourself. Because you're going to die anyways. But your axe still lives somehow. That's nice. Now we're in seven minutes. <laughs> 65 minute game. How long does this game go? Shit, what just happened? I don't care about any of that. Oh, you have Refresher, nice. And BOTs, Jesus Christ, you got rich. Um, let's see. Not really need to use it though. Yeah, doesn't look like it. Alright. It doesn't look as bad looking back at it, does it? Yeah, exactly. It's, I'm a little surprised, to be honest. Because it felt... <laughs> I felt miserable in that game, dude. You kind of need to <laughs> understand that some of the things that may feel like shit aren't necessarily entirely your fault. Some people take that theory a little too far, though. Some people think that everything they happens wrong in a game is everybody else's fault. Well, not their fault, but... Typically, for you as a support player, don't get stressed out. If, you know, fights are going bad, of course it's, you know, going to be stressing, but there's a lot of these things and a lot of the things that are happening in this game that are just really, like, frustrating and just because, you know, this guy's farming one side of the map, this guy's farming another side of the map, this guy's another farming another side, like, no one wants to play together, and this guy's buying all the wards. Alright, but yeah, play in houses, no problem. Yeah, I'm excited for the next one. Yeah, see you, man. Alright, take care, homie.